So good morning, and welcome to Lesson 25 in our study of the Book of Judges. This lesson sort of encompasses both chapters 19 and 20, so it's rather a long section in the book, but we'll try to get through it if we can. And it's important to remember that these two chapters, along with chapters 17 and 18 and 21, all encompass sort of one story or one theme, and this is to illustrate how much depravity, how much the tribes of Israel, the nation of Jude Israel, had gone away from the teachings of God. And it's also important to remember that these events were taking place probably just 40 or 50 years after the death of Joshua. So they actually took place, so they're actually considering events which occurred before the time of the judges and probably similar events which took place between the judges as well. So when you get into this, there's some very graphic details in this section, but it's important to understand the context in which this was being done. When Joshua, before Joshua died, after he, led, after he led the Hebrews into the Promised Land, he made a statement about the nation serving God. And he said, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the nations of Israel, the nations of the Hebrew nations who followed him, said essentially the same thing. In Joshua 24, verse 21, they said, We will serve the Lord. This was their commitment. We will serve the Lord. And in verse 22, he said, You were witnesses against yourselves for saying this. You made a vow and you were witnesses to this. And this section shows how much this vow was broken. And we know from other times that breaking a vow with God can be serious. The idea of what God was going to do for them, or would do for them, in the Promised Land had been laid out back in the, chap in the book of Deuteronomy, chapters 28, 29, and 30. And just for some summary, it said, it said in 28, starting, it said, If you diligently obey the Lord and observe carefully all his commandments, then the Lord God will set you high above all nations with these blessings. He shall be blessed in the city and in the country, in the fruit of your body, the products of, produce of your ground, increase of your hearts. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in and when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies to ri who rise against you to be defeated before your face. And they shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Now this, this is some of the blessings which God said would be on the Hebrew people if they followed his commandments and obeyed his words. Then he said, But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, then cursed shall you be in the city and in the country. Cursed shall your basket and your kneading bowl be. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in and when you go out. He will rebuke you in all that you do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you. He will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with a sword, with scorching, with mildew. Your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. So this are the blessings, the blessings and the curses which God provided and prophesied for the children of Israel if they obeyed his commandments or if they did not obey his commandments. And then in chapter 30, he said, I have set before you today life and the good, death and evil, in that I command you to, walk, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. But if your heart turns away so that you do not bear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, 
I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you will cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. So now he is summarizing the blessings and cursings which he had said before the Hebrew people. And the Hebrew people in the times of Joshua said, we will serve the Lord and we will be witnesses against ourselves. But the people in Judges 2 verse 7 it says, so the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and the elders who were with him, who outlived, who outlived, uh, who lived alongside Joshua, who lived along with him. When that generation died, and another generation arose who did not know the Lord. They did not know the commandments. They did not know God's promises, his blessings, and his cursings. And now we see in Judges, in this chapters of Judges, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, what they had done, how evil they had become, how they had turned away from God, and how... God had started to punish them. And this was the way that this the way the same events which happened between the days of the judges as well. So here we come now to a Levite in those days when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. Levites were not supposed to be in the mountains of Ephraim to start with. He took his himself a concubine from Bethlehem. A concubine was sort of a, a, a non-married wife, a uh, common law wife in those days, a, life, a wife who had been given without a dowry. So this also was not according to God's plan. And this, this woman ended up playing the prostitute, playing the harlot, and went to live with her father. After a few months, this Levite went to collect his wife, went back to her father to collect her. And there was some times when the father of the this concubine, the father of, of the bride, so to speak, entertained the Levite three or four days with uh, food and, and with drink and with hospitality. Now, this, the, the idea of hospitality was very common in those days. This was most important. So this part was not unusual. What was unusual was the fact that there was no punishment given for what, the concub what this woman did to her husband. She played the harlot. There was no punishment given for that. There was no idea of any kind of recrimination. It was all sort of accepted and the, the father-in-law made the, the Levite very comfortable, very welcoming, maybe because he actually enjoyed the Levite or admired him or perhaps he was just glad to get his daughter off his hands again. We don't, we don't really know. And whether this was the same Levite that was reported with Micah also, we don't know. There's controversy about that. So they sat down and they drank and they did this hospitality for a few days. And then in the afternoon of the fifth day, the Levite took his concubine and left. It was late afternoon, not the time when one normally leaves, but late afternoon. Now the idea was, this: there's some things here right away which are not in keeping with God's commandments. The Levite should not have been an Ephraim. The Levite should not have a common law wife, okay? There should be, there was no recrimination given for what had happened between the, the Levite, his concubine, and her father. Anyway, this was all well and good. They left. Now they went on their way back and they did not, they passed by what was called Jerusalem, which was then occupied by the, by the, uh, 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 another, another, another nation, the Jebusites, and they did not want to go in there. They wanted to go to a place called Gilbia, which was in the land of Benjamin. And they went to this town, and it was nighttime. They did not want to stay in the square, but there was no one inviting them in. Now, this again was against the laws of hospitality, because in those days, whenever somebody, a stranger came about, there were so many times when hospitality was important. There were no inns, there was no hotels like there are today. 
it was important that someone invite them in to, to stay with them. But no one seemed to do this. Even, even if this man was a Levite, he was a Hebrew, but no one invited him in to stay until this man came in from the country, this man of Ephraim, who was staying in Gilbia, and accepted him into his house. This was a type of hospitality that was, that was required, and which was often reported in the Bible as being shown to strangers by others. If you look at Genesis 18.4, Genesis 19.2, Genesis 24.32, 48.24, 24, Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, it il illustrates how this hospitality was part of the culture. It was something that was very important. But again, people were not doing what was done in the culture. They had gone, everybody doing their own thing, and as a result, this hospitality in Gibeah was gone, except for this old man from Ephraim, who may have belonged to the first the generation who knew God initially, and not the new generation, so he invited this Levite and his concubine to stay with him. Then it says that the men of the village came to the house wanting this older man to bring out this man who was staying with them so that they could do with them as they please. Okay, they could do with them as they please. They said, bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. <clears throat> This referred to a sexual activity which was not condoned by the Bible and is similar to what was done to Lot when he was in Sodom. When the angels came to stay with Lot, the people wanted Lot to send the angels out so that they could know them carnally. The man from Ephraim said, we cannot do this. But he said, look, here's my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out. Humble them and do with them as you please. <clears throat> In those days, women had no real status. Women had no real place in society except as property, except as being somewhat owned by the, by the men. Daughters were about the same as as uh, as women, females, uh, wives, or concubines, and it was Lot's daughters who went out in Sodom, if you recall. Now the men wants the concubine and the uh, daughter of this Ephraim, of this man from Ephraim, to go out so that they could know them. Women had very little status, and actually it was Christ who had elevated women to the status of equality. When, he said, when they said in the Bible that, there's no, that there will be no male, no female, no slave, no master, everyone should be equal. This is, what was the, this is one of the first teachings of the equality of men and women. But in this case, the concubine was out. She was dealt with by the men out there and came, she was found the next day at the doorstep where she had fallen down and she, had deceased, she was deceased. The Levite, the master come out and just said, get up and go, get up, get up and let us be going. He, this was the concern that he had for her, not for her health, not for her well-being. Let's just get up and go. And when there was no answer, he lifted her up and got up and went to his place. <clears throat> the whole idea of the, of the mistreatment of people by others, the problems with hospitality, the problems with one's status and what one did and where one lived, were all part of this idea that it was against what God wanted people to be like. And this was the final, the final straw for this Levite. 
he did something which is very grotesque. He dismembered his concubine and sent a piece to each of the twelve tribes. Now, this certainly is not something that you want to hear about or see. But in some way, this was what was considered a call to action by the tribes of Israel. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 7, it's talking about a similar event, although it was not involved a human being, it involved oxen. He said, he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. In other words, this can happen to you, to your animals, if you don't join Saul and Samuel in battle. This is what this verse in Samuel is saying, and this is really what this Levite is saying to the tribes of Israel. This has been done. This should not have been done. This was done to me and my family. I need, a, I need, to, be, I need to be avenged. And as a result, as a result of that, the children of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, as well as from the land of Gilead, and the congregation gathered as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. So this did unite, for a period of time, the tribes of Israel. This was one of the first times when people sort of did what was considered in their eyes to be right, and not just what they wanted to do themselves. However, the tribe of Benjamin did not go with them. They sort of, they sort of uh, supported, supported the people of Gilead rather than supporting the Levite. So now we have the tribes of Israel except for Benjamin against the tribe of Benjamin in really what was called a civil war. So. As a result of this, there was a war between Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, and the tribe, other tribes of Israel. Now the other tribes of Israel outnumbered the tribe of Benjamin by a large amount. However, if you read through chapter 20, you'll see that there was a time when the first battle ensued and the tribe of Benjamin defeated the tribes of other tribes of Israel with a great loss of life. And this happened a second time as well. And there was a question, the question always is, why would God allow this? Why would God allow the tribes to be defeated by one tribe, a much smaller tribe, even after they had gone apparently and had prayed? When they went back the third time after sacrificing and praying and fasting and humbling themselves before God, because it seems the first two times they depended on their own strength of numbers more than on God. But this time after being defeated twice, twice, they went back and they, they prayed and went in in a more humble state. And the Lord said, go up for tomorrow, I will deliver them into your hand. They used a different tactic to draw the people of Benjamin away from the city of Gilead. And then they did defeat the tribe of Benjamin and actually destroyed most of the tribe, most of the people except for a few hundred, which escaped. And this is really the whole story about this, is not the fact that there was a war or that there was a, 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 pro, a, a concubine who was dismembered and sent to the various tribes. Not just the fact that this was about a Levite and his father-in-law. This was about not obeying God from the start and all the things in this chapter which go against what God had said that should be done if the tribes of Israel were to be blessed where they lived.
the type of family relationship that they had, the type of, of, of orientation, what the men of the city wanted versus what they should be doing, what was done with women, with the daughter, with the concubine. All of these problems that were there, which God did not want in the first place. And he said, as he said in Deuteronomy, if you don't do what I'm asking you to do, if you don't follow my instructions, if you disobey me, then my blessings will be turned to curses, and you will be defeated before your enemies, and you will be driven out, just as the tribes of Israel were before the tribe of Benjamin. Why do these things happen? Why, do, why does God allow such things to happen as, as is happening today? Why, does, why do the events of the times seem to be so upsetting and so disruptive? We don't really know the answers to all those things. It says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are your thoughts, they are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, say the Lord. The idea of, of what is happening and why they're happening sometimes is hard for us to understand. But even today, if you look back at Deuteronomy and look at the blessings and the cursings, you can see how we today do not follow God's instructions. And as we become more liberal, sometimes we become more distant from what God's instructions were. And as we do that, then perhaps what he said about cursing in those days may be still applicable today. We wonder why things happen. There's another war going on. There's climate change. There's pestilences. There's flooding. There's hurricanes. There's fires. All these things are indicative of the fact that nature, God, the world is not happy with the way it's being treated. And perhaps if we could understand that and put some of the money we put into armaments into solving some of the social and political and environmental problems that we have, we'd be so much better off. But that's not the way man wants to do it. This whole section, and you should read these two chapters for yourself, this whole section shows how far and how depraved the society of Israel had become after the death of Joshua and those elders who lived with him. How within one generation they had gone from being supportive and saying very clearly that we will follow the Lord and we are witnesses to ourselves, going very clearly from that to not knowing God at all. The world has done that and we are now probably paying the price to some extent for it. However, as we see in the next chapter, there is a solution. There has been all along, there was then, there is now, there will be tomorrow. So next week we'll get into the last chapter of this book of Judges and then after that we may start another book, the book of Romans, but for right now that's all for today. Next week we'll do the last chapter in the book of Judges. So I hope you'll join me for that. Bye for now. Thanks for watching.